From Microbe TV, this is Twivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 39, recorded on January 22nd, 2019. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels Eldy. Greetings from LD Lab Studio, and um, happy to be here, Vincent. I almost didn't make it today. Oh, you, you didn't read the paper? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I was trapped at the uh, top of Little Cottonwood Canyon mm-hmm. yesterday. Some buddies and I were going skiing. Right. And it was great because it was a big storm, but it was uh, flying a little too close to the snowstorm. It was coming down so quickly. They ended up closing the mountain. Mm -hmm. Uh, They closed the roads and they wouldn't let us out of the building that we were occupying for a few hours (laughs) called called being interlodged. So So you were in the ski lodge waiting, right? We were in the ski lodge and I don't want to make it sound like this was uh, too much of a hardship. So the, we were just in time for the free, um, wine and cheese hour. So that, <laughs> <laughs> actually we did just fine. And, um, everyone was safe and warm and they ended up opening the road later that evening. So we got back down, um, you know, kind of in the middle of, uh, yeah, right. last night. So I made it in cool. time. Yeah. <laughs> I want to miss Trifo, man. That's right. I've did everything I could and it worked. How was the skiing? Great. Well, that's the thing. So it was set up to be potentially epic, uh, mm-hmm. and we were just surrounded by powder. So I think more than two feet came down yesterday wow. in the mountains. Um, but it was coming so fast that uh, only a couple of chairlifts were open. And yeah. so we were surrounded by some of the best snow uh, powder possible with no access to it. And then by a little afternoon, they closed even the few lifts that were open. And so uh, we were stuck. Hmm. Can't win them all, as they say. So in the end, I think it was four hours of driving, maybe three hours of hanging out in the lodge, and um, four ski runs. So that's more, not a lot. <laughs> no, <it's laughs> a lot of investment, but too bad we had some fun. All right. Well, you're here now. You can have more fun. You can do Twivo. Let's do it. <laughs> and uh, we're back in kind of microbial space again. So last time that was a really fun conversation we had on. Hura Marik's paper. Mm-hmm. Um, this episode, that's right. Uh, we did bacteria last. Time. Yeah, so we were ta- thinking about bacteria. We we're thinking about the mutation rate and how mm-hmm. that might be a sort of changing entity depending on the the background, the ge- genetic background, um, the strain. This time, um, we're hitting Legionella, a really interesting bacterial genus, and so we're a little bit, I would say, in a, a pattern here, maybe a twim evo. <laughs> uh, chapter with a couple of back-to-back microbiology papers. It's, it's funny because we hadn't really done one for the entire run of Twivo until last time. I just checked the list and uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. didn't do any bacteria, and then now we have two in a row. That's pretty cool. You know what's interesting yeah. is that Michelle Swanson over on TWIM works, mm-hmm. works on Legionella. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> um, I'm jealous. She's going to probably want to do this paper over on TWIM. And well, that's not a bad idea. I'll and say, I bet oh, she... Nell's already, already <laughs> hammered that paper. <laughs> well, no, if she wants to do it, I can't stop her, right? Yeah, and I would say she would do it uh, much better justice, certainly from the microbial side. I think um, she would have maybe... a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. Yep, we should have grabbed her for this Twim Evo. But... I should have, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, well, hard I was to thinking get those of it, crossovers. but I didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what do we have here, Nell's? So the paper is entitled, More Than 18,000 Effectors in the Legionella Genus Genome Provide Multiple Independent Combinations for Replication in Human Cells. And the paper just um, showed up, uh, was published in Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, um, just a week or so ago. Um, The lab, this is uh, Carmen Buchreiser's lab, she has her crew at the Pasteur Institute, um, and it's the uh, laboratory for the biology of intracellular bacteria. And Legionella is one of the kind of superstars of intracellular pathogens, as we'll be discussing here moving forward. Mm. I would have called this over 18,000 effectors. 
Yeah, <laughs> like true. Over nine thousand, you know. You know that yeah, you right? know that video game meme. Over nine, it's over nine thousand. Oh, actually, I don't know if I do. You'll have to uh, bring me up to date on this. Um. Well, I'm the wrong person to do that. <laughs> but there's a uh, famous um, part in the video game, mm. and it became a meme. Uh, the video, the original. I'm gonna, you know, if they're young people listening, they shouldn't. <laughs> Listen to me just, do this, but it was on forward. Dragon Ball. <laughs> okay, and um, you've got your pulse on sort of the modern social media. So media here's how it goes: world. I got the, the line was originally said by Vegeta, one of the main recurring characters in the series. Okay, Vegeta, what does the Scouter say about his power? It's over nine thousand. I see. <laughs> so that's the meme. It's over nine thousand. There we go. Well, here we're over eighteen thousand. Eighteen over eighteen thousand effectors. That's and, a lot. And I think that could become a meme. It's yeah. a lot of effectors. And we have a lot of things here that we have to explain. <laughs> we, yeah, we do. Well, so we'll get, we'll get back to that. I just wanted to say maybe up front, the reason um, this paper really caught my eye and um, I, I wanted to um, pay some attention to it today is from an evolutionary standpoint, I think there are three really cool things here. So the first is for this bacteria, Legionella, it has this astounding host range. So it can infect amoebas. In the soil, things like dictostelium, other uh, critters that hang out in the environment, uh, all the way to humans, our own macrophage cells, and so in causing then pneumonia-like symptoms. Do you think there's any viruses that have such an astounding host range? <laughs> uh, yeah, so there are some hints of that. Some of the giant viruses yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you're very familiar with, Vincent, and I, actually we'll get a little cameo from the mimi viruses in a few minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah some of those. Uh, Giant viruses affect amoeba. Some people think they also infect people, although that's kind of not A little clear. controversial, right? Yeah. yeah. Agreed. But so the, here it's pretty clear for Legionella. And when you think about it for a minute, I mean, so the last common ancestor of some of these um, amoeba protozoan species and our, you know, our last common ancestor leading up to the our own lineage, this is more than a billion years of evolutionary divergence. And the fact that a modern bacteria could enjoy the ability to replicate in both cytoplasms that have changed over a billion plus years. That's pretty wild. Yep. Yep. You think it's enjoying it? Uh, well, maybe I read too much into the situation. As you know, it'd be interesting <laughs> if it did enjoy. I guess if if, yeah. uh, if if it's lived for millions of years, it's enjoying it, right? Yeah, maybe. Or, or it's doing it is maybe the better way of saying it. It can do it. <laughs> it can. Yeah. 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 Productively. Okay. Number two, and this will really d dive into is that. There are all these cases of horizontal gene transfer, meaning that the host of Legionella, uh, some of the genes from the host are showing up in the bacterial genome. So somehow there's been this transfer from one species to another, in this case, from host to pathogen. That's also pretty wild. Mm -hmm. um, n obviously not um, uncommon, especially for bacteria that are just sort of masters at picking up genetic material from their environment, from, in this case, the host. Um, but the consequences here and what's um, observed and measured in sort of this uh, comparative genomics view of Legionella evolution, um, it's really, uh, Legionella is one of the best, or at least one of the most prolific at this that has been observed so far. Of course, also viruses do that, right? They do. And I, mean, I, hate, I, I hate to just keep saying that. But, yeah. <laughs> no, it's of your... Uh, your Preaching to the choir, as they say. And that's a question that my lab is actually really excited about and um, we're pursuing in some virus systems as well. And so that's one thing that personally caught my um, attention here. Third, um, these, you know, the way Legionella, and we'll talk a little bit about the replication cycle, the way they get into cells, um, alter the compartments in the cytoplasm to be an intracellular replicating bacteria. This is really sophisticated cell biology. And so, um, this evolutionary idea that if we look at microbes and kind of think of them almost as nature's cell biologists, that they've been through trial and error over millions of years, as you said, or longer, have been able to sort of select on the ability to use uh, cells as a, a place to replicate. Mm -hmm. We'll see in this case many, many examples, some of those horizontally transferred genes, for instance, which allow this to happen. There are clues in there. How do you control that cell process that you might be you might gain by watching how these microbes do it? And so, as you know, cell biologists as a profession, just listening in or looking in on these microbes uh, is another way forward for understanding our own cell biology. Indeed. 
Yeah, they're pretty cool, these Legionella. Really something. I mean, I've got this um, sort of uh, bacterial envy going here, <laughs> wishing, wishing I was studying these guys. I almost did, actually, Vincent. So I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship with Howard Schumann in your... Yeah, oh, uh, interesting. Well, he was in your yeah, neighborhood. Yeah. You remember him? Yep. So he was running a Legionella lab at Columbia yep. for many years. Yep. And then maybe, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, moved to University of Chicago, where he's still... Right. Still going, yeah. So when you were looking for a postdoc, was he here or at Chicago? He was at Columbia. Columbia. It was before he'd moved. Yeah, so I was just in your backyard there. Um, gave a, as a you know senior grad student, I gave a talk mm -hmm. discussing my thesis research and met a few folks there. And um, that was my uh, application for a postdoc. And we were even talking a little bit about that first point, that idea of that massive host range. And for my PhD, I was studying um, a protozoan te called Tetrahymena. Mm -hmm. um, it'll show up a little bit in this paper, actually. Um, and the question I had is one of the, whether we could take some of the Legionella strains that he had in the laboratory and try to adapt them to Tetrahymena. So they don't replicate so well. I don't think there's really a known Tetrahymena Legionella system out there. They they do well in other amoeba or other protozoans, but not in in that species. And so mm -hmm. I was wonder, I was thinking about that as a potential postdoctoral project. I think Howard was super interested. He was also saying, well, "I don't really think much about this evolution. Maybe you should find someone who knows a little more about evolution." And that sort of um, got me onto that fellow Harmit uh, Malik at the mm -hmm. Fred Hutch, where I actually did end up going. For my postdoc. So that's interesting. What would have happened if you had come here? Yeah. And uh, if we would have ever talked or whatever, if there'd ever be a Tuivo, who knows? You might not have gone, <laughs> gone into viruses. Now, Howie was a good friend of mine. I was very sad when he left. Yeah. He was a good yeah. guy to talk to, very smart yep. and thoughtful Great. and kind. Yeah. Yep. Great guy. Yep. No, that's true. You always wonder, actually, in your career, like if you, you can't do the experiment, right? To, um, if you would have gone on a different path or a different, gone to a different lab at, during your training, what would have been different? Who knows? Yeah. Fun, oh, yes, fun. always. The, the, you know, a little fork in the road, you know. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, kind of fun to imagine. Yep. All right. Well, back to Legionella. So, and maybe some background. So, um, uh, to the general public, Legionnaire, uh, Legionnaire's disease, we hear about that from time to time as it crops up as a um, health issue. It's a atypical pneumonia, and this is where Legionella got its name. So before, I, I think it was, um, I was looking up a little bit of the history here. So it was in July 1976 yeah. in Philadelphia, a uh, convention of the American Legion, so some uh, veterans group. Um, they were at a, a hotel meeting and all of a sudden came down with these pneumonia-like symptoms that were a little out of the ordinary. Mm. And it turned out that it was Legionella that had gotten to their macrophages, had caused these um, infections that then were in their lungs. And so that was sort of the start of it. That uh, yeah, I remember sort that, of. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. The, um, Philadelphia strain, which will show up here as well. Um, and so this still will crop up from time to time. So it, the bacteria can hang out in things like the aerosolized layer of hot tubs or in, I think, in like air conditioning units where the where you have the water circulating into droplets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? And, yeah. yeah, and then it moves to, the, um, moves to your respiratory tract. And when it gets there, it can um, set up shop and, and be a real problem. Yeah, we have periodic outbreaks here and there. Mm -hmm. Here in New York, often and elsewhere, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, it turns out that, that that Philadelphia strain, which is sort of now kind of a, cla a medical classic, um, is not the only one out there. And so this study that we're considering today takes a comparative genomics approach to actually survey Legionella diversity. And so they'll report the sequencing of 80 genomes uh, from 58 species. And just to put that in a little bit of context, so I think previous there's some. This isn't the first time that um, people have taken sort of a comparative view of Legionella diversity, but I think there were some, something like 38 genomes done before um, of what they describe as 65 total species. I think that might mean known species. I'm guessing there are probably some other um, strains or species of Legionella hiding out there that we still haven't come across. Would be my best guess. Mm -hmm. So you can do this now, you know, you can actually sequencing 80 genomes, if they're a bacterial genome, uh, is very doable. Um, and that's the sort of meat of today's paper. So that, you know, technically isn't super innovative, 
but there are some, I think, really cool surprises that sort of emerged from this um, uh, broad comparative view that says something about the biology here, especially putting it in kind of an evolutionary context that makes it really fascinating. Lance, give us an, an idea. Like, if you wanted to do this, you got, you know, however many species you want to mm -hmm. sequence of genomes. Well, how much of an investment is that? Is how much in time and how much money and people? Yeah, great is this, question. Is this a big? Because when I was a postdoc, you would never do this. You, it took me one year to do the polio genome, right? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No, that's exactly right. And so, and I would say it's a little bit of a mixed bag, actually. So it's it's actually really, you know, it's simple to say, oh, we'll just do the genome, or we'll do the mm -hmm. genomes. Uh, and we almost throw around that phrase, almost like it's, you know, oh yeah, like I'll just walk down the street and it will kind of fall into my lap. So it is true that the technology is there in in large measure. But then where the real um, time investment, the energy, the everything like that is in not necessarily, um, you know, actually doing, having the genome done, meaning that you, eat, so you'll prepare genomic libraries, you might compare, or depending on the project, you might prepare transcripts. So you have RNA sequences that you can kind of use to help bootstrap. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you'll prepare these libraries, genome scale libraries, send them either, most people send them to a core facility um, where they can, depend, you might wait in line for a couple weeks or something, depending on how much backlog there is, and then throw it onto these massive, um, you know, capacity sequencers, most of them from Illumina to do the short read sequencing. That can go quite quickly and you can get tons of data. These days, you might um, also throw in some long read sequencing. Um, so the PacBio platform is a popular one. The Oxford Nanopore is coming on. This is these little harmonica sized devices we've been playing around in my lab. Um, and that's sort of democratizing some of this genomics because you can do this sort of in your own, set up your own pipelines in your, in your own lab. Mm -hmm. But then, at, you know, so let's say that's about a month if things go, everything goes really well from DNA collection or nucleic acid collection through sequencing. But then I'd say that's where the slog starts is how do you annotate these things? So if you're sequencing a species that where there's not a lot of representation, so there's nothing exists, there's not an existing genome annotated in any database that's available, mm -hmm. then you're really in for um, potentially a tremendous amount of work. Mm -hmm. um, it'll vary depending on how uh, complex is the genome, how repetitive is the genome, how big is it. Um, but that could be years of investment and energy, especially for the bigger genomes out there. Mm. Um, however, if it's a genome where there are some close relatives that have, where people have invested and annotated over years, which is luckily the case for Legionella, for example, um, when you combine that with somewhat smaller genome sizes, so we're, we're talking about kind of give or take uh, on the, or plus or minus around three megabases. So we're, um, you know, uh, a full thousand X down from our own genome, three gigabases. So that's, that simplifies things a lot. And then you, what you can do sometimes for better and for worse is just overlay the new sequences that you get on the um, annotation, for example, of that Philadelphia strain. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand that like simplifies your life computationally. It also, you have to, the, on the other hand, you know, are there interesting things in that raw data sequence that you might be throwing away because you're sort of making assumptions about how similar this already is? And so that's worth kind of stepping back uh, because you could be missing some incredible discoveries if you just sort of rely on the um, kind of ceiling of what's already known yeah, of the current yeah. annotation, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And all that's done in your lab, right? After you get the raw sequence back. Yeah, that's right. And so then, and that's actually, you know, I think that's an open and um, important area of genomics, which is sometimes not talked about as much is, so who's doing that work? Um, who's investing the time and energy? And can you fund that? So, you know, if I told you, you know, I really need to to sequence the genome of this um, New World monkey that's sort of similar to the squirrel monkey, but it's a little bit different. Mm. Um, as a funding agency, you might say, oh, you know what, we just there's probably a dozen new world monkey genomes out there. Why does yours matter so much? Yeah, yeah. And it might, you might have, there might be a biological reason for that. It might be this breakthrough discovery just sort of hiding out in the base pairs. Yeah. And yet it's really, you know, that's, it's hard to get that kind of stuff funded. It's kind of a slog. It's not the most, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, romantic yeah. of work or whatever. It's, it's kind of in, work in the trenches of going through all of the genomic data and the pipelines and using different, 
uh, programs to try to um, put this together and even sometimes hand curate some of the stuff. I mean, it's, it's a massive job and yet um, the incentives can be not so high. And there are individuals who like to do that and not actually do wet experiments, right? That's right. And so I think, you know, best case scenario for a lot of these projects that become more kind of personalized or at the, at the sort of individual lab level or several lab levels is to team up. Um, and the trick here, I would say, is not to make it, you know, oh, just annotate this genome for me. That way you might yeah, get, if, yeah. as a wet bench biologist, you might get laughed out of the room. It's <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you say, oh, you know what, this genome has all of these unusual repetitive elements or all this copy number, then is, are you interested in copy number variation genomes? A lot of the dry labs, that that's an active area. And so mm, yeah. they might be thinking, you know, we have these tools or these ideas for um, maybe tackling the human genome, for example. But if you have a genome that might be, for whatever reason, really good at revealing some of these features that then they can use to test their tools or to develop tools, then it becomes more of a 50-50 proposition where there's sort of intellectual investment on both sides. I think that's your best mm -hmm. case scenario for moving genomes. Is that how you do it? You don't have dedicated people to just do bioinformatics, do you? That's No, I don't. And so what we try to do um, is team folks up. So convince um, some of our genome science colleagues that we have some interesting questions and interesting sort of genomic features. Um, maybe take a, a couple of grad students um, team them up on a project where they're sort of taking complementary and slightly overlapping approaches um, and seeing kind of where, what happens. And mm. yeah, it's kind of fun to see that. And, and um, we've done a little bit of this with some virus genomes, some large virus genomes. And I think at the end of it, both the um, my colleague, Aaron Quinlan, who's a genome scientist, and I look back and we say, wow, both our trainees can now do more than either of us can do. And so that's uh, it's pretty fun. It can be kind of rewarding. So I have to tell you, when I was a postdoc, when I went to David Baltimore's lab, he said, I want you to clone and sequence polio. I said, mm -hmm. okay. So I went in the lab. I ran sequencing reactions, ran gels. I read them. And then I would type them into a computer. Mm -hmm. And we had a program that would look for overlaps in your sequences and make what we called contigs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'd build them, and then you'd go back and do some more sequence. And I just went back and forth myself. You know, I would do my gels, read them, put them in the computer, back and forth, yeah, until yeah. it got longer and longer, a couple of big contigs, and then finally you fill in the little bits, yeah. and you get it. So I did that myself. And then we had no other genomes to compare to. We had this 7,442 sequence. Yep. We had an open reading frame. We didn't know what any of the proteins looked like. Yeah. It's 19, 1980. We didn't have motifs. We had nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. <laughs> you couldn't even use that meme over 9,000 since you only had 7,400 yeah, pairs. Yeah, right? we couldn't, we couldn't do it. <laughs> but that's how it's changed. You, you collaborate. I mean, then we said, okay, we need to get some protein sequence. So we went to a protein sequencer. Now, back then, getting a protein sequence was a big deal, right? Oh, yeah. You had to do Agreed. Edmund mm -hmm. degradation. Degradations. Sure. And yep. it is a specialized technique, that, and you needed a machine. And mm -hmm. so, you know, David, he convinced someone to do it, and we gave him some protein and got some sequence. But it's all different. Very different. Although it's interesting how some of the same old problems show up. So we were yeah. just, um, I won't go deep into the weeds here, but we were just looking at some zebrafish genes or some... Uh, comparative RNA seq data. So we we're looking at transcripts, and um, we thought we had identified a set, and yet there were at least um, a handful of unannotated, just kind of right beneath our nose. That if we went back and sort of hand curated them, they're real genes. They're kind of household name genes, conserved across vertebrates, um, and yet they're not currently in any of the databases of the zebrafish annotations. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. still a lot of mm -hmm. holes. We sometimes, yeah, it's, it's you get kind of comfortable. With this idea that, especially for genetic model systems, that it's sort of done or that the, the annotation is good. There's so much um, stuff that's still just right under your nose that isn't yeah, actually yet. It's there. a mine. It's beautiful. Right? Yeah. You, just, yeah, yeah. you go in it and you can get more and more. It never runs out. <laughs> yep. So speaking of that mine, let's get back to Legionella, the, <laughs> the star of this show. So, so immediately from these 80 genomes and... Uh, from a genomic standpoint, I think, you know, relatively straightforward because of the um, previous work, including, um, you know, 
uh, nearly 40 species from before. You could really build off of that mm. um, foothold. But already some surprises from just advancing beyond there. So first of all, the genomes they've sampled can be two times difference in size. Mm -hmm. So I think the smallest one was 2.4 megabases. The largest one was almost 2x that. I mean, imagine that like if (laughs) in our own species, right? Some of us might have three gigabase genomes. Others might have six gigabase genomes. It'd be like, hey, how do you know it's not true? Well, we've only sequenced so certainly the, the, less than yeah. a million gene, human genomes, right? <laughs> Maybe it's hiding out there. Yeah, the full genome duplication. Let's keep our there. We go. Let's keep our. Is there is any uh, reason mind why open. it couldn't happen? Um, do you think well, that, that the Homo sapiens genome has been homogenized sufficiently? Yeah, that would be pretty tough. I think just given um, the constraints of meiosis, maybe th- yeah. to see, you know, we do see cases of um, single chromosome um, duplications, probably most famously trisomy 21. Yeah. Um, but then that's already like kind of on the edge of um, human development. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yep. And so I think that's just given our species, things become a bit more constrained. Um, not the case for Legionella. Um, also interesting, so the uh, kind of wild differences in GC content. So this is, mm. you know, AT, Cs, and Gs complementary. So if you just look at Cs and Gs, you can just take a simple percentage, and that gives you a sense of sort of the, the genome's composition. Um, so GC here among that sampling of Legionella species was between 35% on the low end and more than 50% on the high end. So that will be a mm. kind of a cool clue for some of the other biology here in a minute. Um so now let's now that they've got these um, genomes, how many genes are there actually, and how many are found throughout? Um, this is another surprise. So, you know, there's many thousands of genes in any given bacterial genome here, but only a thousand are common among all of the species that they sampled, and so that sort of hints at this remarkable diversity of species-specific genes in that same genus. Um, there's a lot of genes out there. So they classify more than or approximately 18,000 clusters of orthologs. So these are genes that show up at least um, more than once. They're not, they're not singletons. And there's probably more out there. And so they mm. um, there's a nice graph in figure one where it's, it shows on the y-axis the number of genes and then on the x-axis the number of genomes. And so, of course, the more genomes you sequence of the same, you know, in, in that same genus – Pretty soon, the idea is that you've accounted for them all, and so your graph will start to flatten out. Mm. Um, they're anticipating there are still lots of genes that they yeah. haven't hit a plateau yet. Yeah, it's not flattening at all. <laughs> yeah, up around fifteen thousand. So it is. It's not quite as drastic as you know. So in those first few genomes that you sequence, you've discovered all the genes, right? Mm-hmm. Or for that for that one, so that's a, a pretty big advance. Um, here it flattens out, or it's it is starting to flatten out, but it, there's a lot more diversity out there. It appears. Hmm. So, um, who are these genomes? So, if you look at um, figure one here, they have a really nice phylogenetic tree of sort of all 65 or so. And near the bottom are these uh, pneumophila species. These are the ones that are probably most well sampled because they've shown up in patients' lungs. You can find the Philadelphia strain Hmm. hiding out there. Um, but then there are some interesting ones I didn't really know about some of this diversity. So a lot of them are named after, like that Philadelphia, named after the location they were found. There's Long Beach A. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that actually, I guess, shows up in the clinic from time to time. Uh, Tucson Ensis, uh, yeah, Bozmani. Yeah. So we're kind of moving around the Southwest here. There's one here from Lansing. Must be Michigan, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. It's probably familiar to uh, Michelle Swanson yeah. in that neighborhood. I think my favorite, just from browsing the list, was uh, Legionella Shakespearei. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so you just, anyway, you just get a flavor of some of the diversity. And then you also get a flavor for just how kind of dynamic the genomes are. So there's a, some bars showing the differences in size that we already mentioned. And then another, they're also classifying singletons. So how many times does that gene only show up in that species? And that's pretty surprising, right? I think we're really kind of used to this notion that genomes are pretty static things for the bacteria, you can kind of throw that idea out the window. If you, you know, uh, browse across some of these, there might be hundreds of genes that are just specific to that species in the genus. So all closely related, but very different gene content. And some of these have very high singletons also. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yep. Would you guess those are the older or the younger ones? 
Well, so that's, yeah, so that's one of the questions that they address here. And that's where actually, again, taking a phylogenetic perspective, mm. you can start to get at that. So when did those genes arrive and how did they get there? And so given all of that um, sort of g- genomic volatility, they um, take a deeper look at this notion of horizontal gene transfer. And so we mentioned this before. This is that idea that when you look at the genes in the bacterial genome, um, they're, they're another surprise is that actually these are the same genes that you would predict would be in eukaryotic genomes. So, and that's, how do you define that actually? So I, I didn't, the cutoff they used, um, which I think makes some sense is that, so how would you define a gene as eukaryotic versus bacterial? And so the definition they use is that if the gene is found in greater than three quarters of eukaryotic genomes, but fewer than 25% of bacterial genomes that then you would classify that as a eukaryotic gene. So that becomes kind of important because you're with horizontal gene transfer that can go, the transfer can go in both directions, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So a bacterial gene could go to a eukaryotic genome and that certainly happens. Um, It's probably more rare Um, or the reverse. And that's what they're really trying to study here. And so using that metric, they are able to find, to find, more than a hundred different protein domains that are quote unquote eukaryotic. Hmm. Um, and kind of getting to your question, Vincent of like how uh, recent is that there is a clue in that GC content. So the ones that are lower in GC content um, that mirrors the host genomes, mm-hmm. uh, the eukaryotic mm-hmm. genomes, which have higher AT content. Mm-hmm. And so what you can infer, it's not necessarily a perfect inference, but you can set, you could, uh, build a hypothesis that the genomes that you see with higher AT, um, and you can kind of go down the list. And so, for example, n- near the very bottom, there's one that's above 50%. This is Legionella gastiana. Um, the idea there would be it had it maybe it had sam- it's been sampling host genes more recently mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because it, it has that sort of composition more close to the host itself. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. That's that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So now hundreds of eukaryotic genes, this will start to kind of um, circle back to that idea of Legionella as a cell biologist. What are these functions? How does it manipulate its host um, cell as part of its replication cycle? And so you can start to look and catalog what are these domains. And so you find genes that are involved, for example, in the ubiquitin pathway. Mm-hmm. And so this is this you know small peptide tag that can where you can regulate the degradation of proteins. So why would a Legionella, uh, you know, why would a ubiquitin sort of regulating protein or targeting protein? Why would that show up in a bacterial genome? So one idea would be this is uh, this would degrade the, the bacteria would basically target the host to de- to degrade an immune function, for example, so that the Legionella could go along with its replication cycle. All kinds of anchorins, these are involved in protein-protein interactions, perhaps, again, allowing the bacteria to manipulate host proteins by interacting with them in ways that would manipulate or modulate the functions. And so maybe we should step back, actually, and um, consider a a few more details. Actually, the cell biology or the details of the replication cycle. We haven't talked Mm -hmm. too much about Mm -hmm. this. So, and you can just go on the internet on Google. (laughs) (laughs) Not too surprising. Type in Legionella replication cycle, go to images, and you have all these beautiful cartoons of cells getting insulted by Legionella. Uh, it's really a cool replication cycle. So the bacteria fools the macrophage, for example, or the amoeba to take it up by phago- something like phagocytosis, where the entire bacterial cell is engulfed into the cytoplasm. Um, after even five minutes, the bacteria is encased in a vacuole, the Legionella vacuole, it's called, this uh, compartment. There are things like um, endoplasmic reticulum membrane starting to show up in little blebs around that vacuole. There are mitochondria being recruited. Um, what's happening is, and we haven't mentioned this yet, but Legionella has this really sophisticated secretory complex or secretory system, uh, type 4 secretory system, which acts almost like a needle coming out of the bacteria cell can poke through that vacuole and start to secrete proteins into the cytoplasm of the infected cell. 
And those are the effectors. So that 18, in the title of the paper, those 18,000 effectors, those are proteins made by the bacteria secreted through that secretory system out into the cell. Um, not only, it's sort of a two for one, not only is that allowing the bacteria to secrete proteins, but some of these type four systems are also actually probably involved in that horizontal gene transfer. They're picking up transcripts somehow or, or genetic material from the host and in some cases, putting it back into the Legionella genome, sort of sampling these functions to see what, and, and then given some time, sort of by trial and error, if this might take up a function that's useful for bacteria to replicate, these will have an advantage over bacteria that don't have that gene. This will be the sort of descendants of Legionella today. And that's what's really remarkable about these genomes is they're just chocked full of these effector genes that are horizontally gene transferred. So all this sort of history of sampling host genes and then repurposing them back to do the replication. Now, a couple of questions. One, in the amoeba, is the cycle similar? Is uh, taken up by, you know, phagocytosis and some of the same things happen that you just mentioned? Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, so these um, amoeba are sort of professional um, uh, eaters. (laughs) They're, you know, they're really uh, adapted as part of their um, gaining nutrition from the environment is to take up things uh, like Legionella or smaller particles. Um, but yeah, so then that matches our macrophages are similar. And mm. in this case, they are uh, sort or have evolved at an immune function um, to take up microbes that might be infecting our tissues. Um, but yeah, so there's sort of a mirror there, even though there's all that, long time of divergence, sort of similar biological or cell biological functions in phagocytosis. So when we, I guess most of these eukaryotic genes are coming from amoeba, right? Because I think the human, the contribution of human genes, which would be more contemporary, I suppose, uh, Mm -hmm. we just, we would know it if, if, if that were happening there, right? Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Vincent. And so what they do, and we'll get into the details of this um, in a minute or two, but as they, well, Two, two approaches. One is a simple blast search. So you can take these eukaryotic like proteins that they're, or genes that they've found from their genomic analysis, compare that to everything in the database and ask what gene looks the closest to that outside of Legionella. And you can just run down, they show table one, a list of these, and, and they are focusing on one family of proteins. But they're basically all from amoeba or they're from ciliates. So from paramecium, mm. tetrahymena. My old favorite from Stentor, this giant ciliate that's com- the cell, single cell can be a millimeter long. <laughs> <laughs> um, Entamoeba, uh, some famous or well studied um, amoeba species, Naglaria, all of these guys. And so that, you're exactly right. So, what that indicates um, or is consistent with is this idea of Legionella sort of as a much more recent and even accidental pathogen of humans. Mm -hmm. Um, It spends most of its time out in the soil, out in the environment, in ponds and other places infecting these protozoans. Yeah. I don't know if it's in humans long enough to have any evolution of that sort, right? Yeah, Yeah, or hasn't been yet. And that's, I think that's an interesting question as well. And they'll get, and there are some experiments in this paper. It's not just um, genomics. We'll discuss that um, in a little bit. But so one thing you can do is not only do a blast search where you can get some indication, but you can also start to do this, um, put this into a phylogenetic context again, right? So not only do you do a blast search to get sequences related, but you start putting them into trees based on sequence homology. And so here they decided to focus on, I mean, there's hundreds of these um, orthologous proteins, and that would be sort of a massive undertaking. But they focused on a couple of families, the um, in particular, some small some genes encoding small GTPases. So, do you want to take a minute, Vincent, to um, introduce <laughs> what GTPases do for our listeners? Wow, GTPases <laughs> are so important. These are little enzymes that uh, are involved in all kinds of cell functions. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're first maybe they're first discovered through uh, the regulation of proliferation. Mm -hmm. Um, And in cancer, they can go awry. Um, Cell survival, migration, uh, and they're basically um, proteins that hydrolyze GTP. uh, And and you get energy out of it, and then things happen downstream uh, when that happens. 
And everyone, yeah, m- some of you might know a famous GTPA <laughs> called RAS. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> which was first discovered as a, an oncogene picked up by retroviruses and mm-hmm. has since, you know, that's, it brings to a funny thing that the name oncogene is not really right because they're, they, these are cell proteins <laughs> yeah, yeah. who have essential roles in controlling cell division in many things. And only when they're picked up by a retrovirus that bad things can happen, but that's you know, right. that's the way their name is given. But this RAS family, huge, has all has five branches. They're called RAS, RO, RAB, ARF, and RAN, and these have incredible uh, functions in all sorts of cellular activities. They're also widespread, not just in in mammals. You know, they're in they're in flies and worms and yeast and and uh, s- slime molds, plants. <laughs> they're all over the place. Really important, but they're, yeah, not, right. they're not too present in, in prokaryotes. Is, is yeah, not that's so that. much, exactly. And that's where Legionella kind of stands out above the crowd again. And so it's really, I mean, it's an amazing just um, sort of biological function, right? So you take GTP, the simple nucleotide, and then depending on the phosphate groups that are on there, um, whether it's GDP or GTP, you can then um, do all kinds of signaling, just like you're describing, Vincent. It's sort of been diversified out to all kinds of core functions and the way uh, proteins interact, depending on the cycle of the, of, of these GTPases acting um, can mean the difference between going forward in the cell cycle, like you're yeah. describing or for the RAB GTPases to actually identify a vesicle um, mm-hmm. or a compartment that then might traffic somewhere and fuse with something. So it's, really an amazing sort of communication system or almost identification system for conducting the business of being a cell. You can find it on Wikipedia, man. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the first two RAS genes from cancer-causing viruses, Harvey sarcoma virus and Kirsten sarcoma virus by Ed Skolnick. Wow. Some... Uh, Great classic history, yeah. I love history, yeah. I do too. So so the RABs, I've kind of been a fan of these proteins for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, owing to their roles in membrane trafficking, which I think is really interesting. And so as, the, um, as that Legionella is secreting some of these effectors, some of these RABs, that's probably, and it's been shown in some cases, that's what's re- recruiting some of these ER, the endoplasmic mm-hmm. reticulum membranes, that's potentially recruiting the mitochondrion it's re- sort of remodeling or reorganizing the membrane around that vacuole basically legionella is making a comfortable little home for itself um, uh, inside of the cytoplasm of the cell you come back in a few hours um, i think five or six hours later and that one legionella that infected the cell it's now dividing into two and more <laughs> uh, <laughs> the membranes are changing again and then after I think 14 hours, you have that vacuole is just chocked full. It's been with tons of Legionella that then figure out how to burst free to undergo exocytosis and then go on to infect neighboring cells. And there you have the, the replication cycle. So it's sort of orchestrated by all of these effectors, including these GTPases, um, where the cell is sort of you know building the ER, building the Golgi, the regular secretory pathway. Now it's getting hijacked by Legionella as it's uh, spitting out all these proteins that have, that look very, you know, by a blast search are nearly identical, but have changes that somehow allow for this replication to happen. It's sculpted the cell functions for its own replication. Yep. Yep. So, okay. So that's cool. So you can start identifying these things, but this is where the, um, again, the sort of phylogenetics helps. So you can, you know, we still have that issue or that formally it could be, are these genes, is th- are these bacterial genes that are in the host genome, or is this the um, accepted view that it's going from host genome to bacteria genome? And so if you just take a bunch of these sequences, you can actually put them into trees and ask, where did these come from by the arrangements on the tree? Mm-hmm. And so this is where you kind of get the sense, um, in addition to just total sequence homology, um, you can actually um, locate where these genes likely originated, who donated those geno- those genes to Legionella. And again, this is where the protozoans really come forward. And here's where the Mimi virus, that giant virus, makes its first appearance. There's actually some genes in the Legionella genome that look a lot like Mimi virus proteins more than mm-hmm. anything else. Mm-hmm. And so what you've got potentially is this scenario 
in um, in amoeba um, phagosome, those phagocytic compartments, where you've captured both legionella, or just those guys are going around gobbling up particles from their environment. And if they get both a legionella as well as a mimi virus or other giant viruses, all these things are all kind of hanging out and genes start swapping in, you know, three directions or more directions. And you might, you probably remember better than me, Vincent, but I believe the mimi viruses, if you look at those genomes, you can find eukaryotic genes. Some of them are protozoan genes and maybe oh, even sure. some bacterial yeah. genes, some archaeal genes. So it's sort of mm-hmm. a, almost like a, a melting pot um, of genetics. Totally. Yeah. You can certainly see genes from the amoeba host, but also genes from other sources, including bacteria. Mm-hmm. Can you tell if the if this particular uh, Legionella gene is something that came from Mimi virus, or did it come into Mimi so quickly from the host that you really can't tell? Yeah. So that's where right. That's where those these phylogenetic trees can help. So, yeah. excuse me. Depending on the arrangement, if um, if the Mimi virus version of the gene is nearly identical to the Legionella version relative mm. to the um, host, eukaryotic yeah. version, yeah, host versions, yeah. then that can give you some clues depending on how that arrangement goes. To mm-hmm. be honest with you, the Mimi viruses and the Legionella are sort of so prolific at this, like the direction of that exchange between potentially virus and bacteria, that might be harder to um, really nail down just taking this uh, phylogen- uh, evolutionary view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then um, we've got this kind of melting pot of genes. I think it's really fascinating to just kind of think about the implications of that. Like, how do how do things how do species evolve? So certainly, this is probably happening like way more than we sort of recognize out in the environment. But could this even be happening in our macrophages under like in, in with clinical strains of viruses, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. Um, and the in clinical strains of bacteria? I don't know that that's really been considered um, really closely yet. There could be some surprises there. Um, you can also, you know, th- the next question that comes up as we're talking about all of this transfer is like, so are you constantly gaining genes? Are you losing them? So this is the idea would be all things being equal, that it's sort of a random sampling of genes. And we might predict just sort of knowing how kind of the mutational process works, that most of the things that you would, uh, that might arrive might be useless to the bacteria that might be even detrimental to the bacteria. It might, uh, you might gain a new gene that interrupts an essential gene that sort of wouldn't, wouldn't be a viable way forward. Those bacteria would just sort of quickly be lost from the population. They certainly wouldn't outcompete um, the other Legionella that are dividing like crazy in those vacuoles. So you can also, when you're taking this comparative approach, you can also infer gene gain and gene loss events. So just by asking which genes are home in among those 80 or so genomes, and here you're using sort of this um, idea of parsimony. What is the simplest explanation to get the pattern that you observe uh, from the sampling? So if something was acquired or gained a long time ago, you might expect to see it in all of the genomes that you sample, all 80. Mm-hmm. So that would be a single gain sort of in the common ancestor of all those Legionella. Um, as they diversify into separate species, everyone hangs on to it. Uh, now let's say you've got a couple of them are missing it and you have really good genomes. And so you've convinced yourself that it's not just that your annotation is bad. Then that would be a gene loss event. It might be for whatever reason, maybe another gene came in that's even better at that function um, or a gene interrupted that function. It wasn't super necessary to compete with other bacteria. So then you might start to see losses. And so they start doing this for several gene families and you start to see this really, some really cool patterns emerge. So um, first of all, gene gains and losses are happening all the time. Some of them are ancient, some of them are super recent. Um, but more than that, and what is sort of different than a lot of bacteria associated with hosts is that the gain events far outstrip the loss events. And that's sort of um, backwards from what you usually see with bacteria the longer they spend with hosts. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. right, when things become symbionts, like the most extreme cases of things like mitochondria, there are very few genes left in the mitochondrial genome. It's been, the genome reduction is sort of the rule for these long associations. That's true too of um, symbionts that show up like in insect genomes that need to, you know, gain nutrients out of 
uh, sap and things that they eat off of bark or whatever off of trees, <laughs> uh, the bacteria often donate those functions. They get, yeah, um, yeah. but then the those genomes are like two, three hundred thousand base pairs. That's right. Some exactly, they're tiny. So and, why why aren't these being reduced? Yeah. So <laughs> these are doing the opposite, right? They're actually getting bigger, um, and we see that twofold difference in that sampling. And so the idea is that these are kind of harkens back to that point that these guys are generalists. They can infect such a broad range of hosts that maybe in all that bouncing around, they're, they kind of keep growing bigger instead of getting smaller. They haven't settled in on one host. Um, that's also consistent with the point you were raising, Vincent, about not being in humans for very long. You don't yeah. see any human yeah. genes, and they also aren't getting smaller. They're not like becoming symbionts or becoming enslaved. They're sort of super independent or something like that. So we mentioned amoeba, but what else in the range from amoeba to humans? What else do Legionella infect? Yeah, good question. It's, I don't know. So I, I think just given the um, cell biology, it would definitely have to be a cell type that um, does this process of phagocytosis. So there are a lot of other, um, you know, between protists and um, kind of uh, metazoans, uh, multicellular, mm -hmm. like mammals, everything else. Um, there are a lot of single cell critters out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in, in many of them, like algae, other things, they have other routes of taking up. So everyone needs to sample stuff from their environment um, to eat, basically, um, or to sense the environment and um, to, com to communicate with uh, the environment or other members of that species. But there are many mechanisms of doing that, not all phagocytosis. There are other sort of flavors of endocytosis. Um, and so that might give some clues about actually range limits. So there's you're kind of on uh, d uh, deep evolutionary divergence, but there certainly might be many species that wouldn't be vulnerable just because they don't do phagocytosis. I mean, I don't know if, if these amoeba would present a broad enough host to really justify all this genome expansion. It would have to be something else, I would guess. Just my feeling. I, I don't know for sure, right? Yeah. No. So the observation is there. They're getting bigger. And the idea is that this might sort of relate to not specializing um, but certainly, you know, all those effectors, yeah. they've, they're somehow, you know, sampling these genes or repurposing them. Like that has been a successful strategy for the Legionella of today. It's pretty unusual. Yeah. There aren't a lot yeah. of bacteria that do that. Um, probably might be some, somewhat contingent on that, um, the type 4 sec secretory system that they're complex that they encode. Mm -hmm. um, that probably, that might have something to do with it. And they're just uh, sort of gene vacuums. Uh, from that standpoint. Yeah. Question is, how much bigger can they get? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because we said before, you know, the human genome is probably not going to get much bigger. Mm -hmm. And what constraints are there for Legionella that will eventually it will meet the wall and not get any bigger? Yeah, so good. We're, we're looking at something very dynamic here, clearly. I agree. And so, you know, here, the biggest genomes, they're, that's the other nice thing about having this sort of this all in a tree. You can see that there's been at least three independent cases where the genome is um, up above four megabases, um, nearly mm -hmm. twice mm -hmm. as big as sort of the um, other strains. And so, but the biggest one to date is just under five megabases. Yeah, I don't know. Is there, there must be some ceiling, this, obviously, but um, could there be, just be that the next several sequenced will sort of break that record? Very possible. It's interesting because these have been around a while and, you know, probably millions of years. Mm -hmm. So it's got to it's got to reach some point. I suspect if you sampled more, you get some bigger ones, too. Right. I think so. Um, there's also, you know, it's not all gains, too. So there are certainly it's yeah. well known for yeah. viruses yeah. that there can be some real fitness advantages to having a streamlined genome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can replicate faster. takes uh less energy to uh, replicate your genome. All of those things can give you um, the ability to replicate faster, to divide faster. And so it's kind of these competing um, fitness interests in some way. If you got some, you might tolerate a big addition to your genome if it gave you the ability to, you know, um, do something to the cell that really allows you to replicate faster, gain a new nutrient or something like that. Um, but then, given some time, you might whittle. It might, might be whittled away just to that core function mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. if you reduce the genome size and then can replicate faster that way. And so it might be. It's kind of a seesaw of back and forth adaptations potentially.
Yeah, maybe. I mean, it could be that we're looking at the range of sizes be- that reflects that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a probably a pretty good mm-hmm. representation given that the, that's pretty deep sampling mm-hmm. already, certainly of the species uh, already known. It would be interesting to do an experiment where you go to some locale, you know, it could be your backyard, Nels, mm-hmm. or a bigger farm area where mm-hmm. there is plenty of Legionella in the soil amoeba and just sample it over a long time, over multiple seasons, and you see under different environmental conditions what happens to the genome of these bacteria, right? Yeah. I'm imagining someone's doing that. I don't know of the work. That would be really interesting. That's a sort of uh, long-term, same place study. Same place. Yeah. Yep. Just, you know, yep. summer, winter, spring, fall, you know, see what's there's going to be different stresses on the amoeba and on the Legionella and what happens to the genome. And yeah. you, you wouldn't be able to identify precisely what's going on, but you could see if there's some accordion. Hey, you could call an accordion. <laughs> Genomic accordions. <laughs> That's right. I was just thinking of the species name, Salt Lake Cityensius or <laughs> Manhattan EI or something like that, if you were doing it there in well, your I, I would like to call it Legionella Nels LDNs. <laughs> that happens too. People do name some of these uh, species names after people. Shakespearei, although that's also a location, I think, too, isn't it? Might be, yeah. yeah. Okay, so circling back, we're kind of coming to the end here. There are a couple, there's actually one more really cool point I wanted to make from the, or, or two points, to be honest, of, from the um, from the study. So they, this is where they get, we get back to the title name. So these 18,000 effectors. And Basically, um, what's really interesting is that this if you go from strain to strain, these are not the thousand core genes. These are all quite different, mm-hmm. it's a, but it's not totally different. So these are different co- sort of um, arrays of some of those small GTPases, some RAS genes, some RAB genes, others. And so the question that comes out here is whether, is there actually multiple ways of sort of solving the same functional problem? Convergent evolution. So as as these populations have spread out and are sampling different genes from their hosts, basically there are, there's more than one path, more than one way to get to the function that you need. And that's kind of, I think, the picture that's emerging because there's certainly a few core things, but that's, those are things kind of involved in core bi- uh, bacterial functions, things like, you know, that you need to do to replicate. But the ones that go out into the cytoplasm, it's like you can sample from a few and maybe keep sort of a customized set to sort of complete the same job. So this idea of independent evolution or convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. So now finally they do an experiment and here this is, uh, Hey, they've been doing experiments. Well, they've been doing, sorry, they have, you're right. They're actually, they confirm experimentally that some of these secreted effectors, proposed effectors, the new ones that they see actually are effectors. They're secreted. Mm -hmm. They do some assays to test that. And then the final experiment they do is to just take a sampling of these um, this, these many species and to see whether they can productively infect human macrophage cells. So this mm-hmm. is the THP1 cell line. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of cool. So this is, you already mentioned, Vincent, this is sort of the accidental pathogen, the idea that these things are super happy hanging out like in ponds or, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's just recently when we started with air conditioners that can aerosolize droplets or hot tubs or whatever, that these things are starting to um, get into our lungs. Um, but so they're asking, you know, among all of this diversity, um, and by the way, n- up until her- now, 90% plus of infections that have been observed in the clinic are the pneumophila species. Um, two or 3% are the long beachie species. Um, but there's, uh, you know, 50 more species here. Mm-hmm. So of them, how many can infect the macrophages? And what they found, I thought was uh, maybe not totally surprising, but maybe a little um, scary. At least nine of those diverse species could replicate um, to the same level or even better mm-hmm. than the pneumophila species. Yep. And so then you can go back. So you've got that list for each of these. So again, convergent evolution in this case for the ability to infect human cells you can go back and ask, are there common effectors in these genomes that might sort of give you a, a, a signature of what it would take to be able to navigate a human cell? Mm-hmm. And what they find is, no, there actually isn't a common set among those nine species. So that, again, it sort of gives you this idea that there is more than one way to infect a human cell, that you sort of collect 
these different effectors um, and still have that ability. And so there's many pathways potentially um, to gaining the ability to infect humans. And they say this capacity to infect human cells has been acquired independently s- several times. Mm-hmm. Just randomly, as these bacteria are acquiring genes, boom, you get the right combination that allows you to grow in human cells. Most of the time, it's not going anywhere. It's in a pond mm-hmm. in uh, Lansing, Michigan, You're right. but gets into a cooling tower, can infect you. It's just really remarkable. It's a yeah, it really is. nice kind of crystallization of accidental infections, right? I agree. And and raises some more cool questions. So, you know, are, are they pre-adapted in a sense? Are they just by getting some combination of these things potentially from amoeba species or other protozoans? Mm-hmm, is there mm-hmm. is there some like kind of or some set of combinations that then give access to human cells? Or do you how much do you need how much do these species need to spend time in human cells and do they need to gain actually something from the human cells in order it, in order to be adapted. It yeah. doesn't look like that because there aren't a lot of direct matches to human cells. Again, getting at the very recent um, spillover to humans, but um, I think a lot more um, interesting questions to explore. So I'm thinking that, you know, there are some animal models. It would be interesting to take some of these isolates that do not replicate, but you could see some that don't replicate and say they animal and see what you would take to push them to be able to and uh, agree maybe maybe grow them in amoeba put them in the animal or, or see if they undergo mutation but it wouldn't really be the same as what happened before right yeah, and that yeah. that brings up a line i read in a book by nick lane he says evolution is a historical science mm. it's what happened <laughs> right and you can't usually hope to recapitulate that you might know you might learn about the forces and selection and so forth, but you're not likely to duplicate everything. So, yeah, you know, what, yeah. and, and that brings up somebody posted, I think it was Elio Schechter on his blog, hmm. said, Oh, do an experiment to prove that mitochondria came from bacteria. Hmm. And, and, um, someone said, You know, why do you have to do that? Evolution's done. You don't have, <laughs> to, you don't have to prove that it happened this way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yep. Although I know, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. I do, and I agree. I also think you know that proving is one thing; learning the rules is another. Exactly. And exactly. so, yeah, you can learn the rules, right? That's right. And that's where you know, especially these microbes, where that experiment you're proposing to kind of sample, you know, in an animal model or something like that. That's that's where the real traction is, where you can start to learn the rules. So you can see evolution yes. actually playing out in real time, those exactly. prosology and transfer events. That's um, exactly it, the rules, because you're yeah. not going to say, this is what happened. That's you right. can't, right? Yep. So it probably happened so long ago that it's different. everything's different. But yes, the rules are what you learn, and that's mm-hmm. why we use animal models. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, so I agree. So the you know the best possible way to really understand evolution would be to invent a time machine to go back. Totally. And <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> and then also, you know, invent sort of a, uh, you know, whatever, millions of years lifespan so that you can document that whole process unfolding. None of that's going to happen. And so then the question is between learning the rules, between inferring to reconstructing ancestral stuff and putting this together in new ways with experiments, how far can we go back almost, you know, it's not going to be a perfect time machine, but the more effort that we put to this, and I think diversified effort, so mixing, you know, combined evolutionary thinking with experimental approaches, that's what's really exciting here because you can start to push back um, those inferences and the confidence that you can have in those inferences farther and farther. And I think that's starting to happen and sort of is one of the emerging really cool things in the field. I mean, this is a a reason why we have to look now and sample frequently. So, for example, we now have this great catalog of Legionella genes. They should People working in the field should continue to sample mm. – and if they're lucky, they may see some changes which coincide with an outbreak, right? Yeah. That would be the coolest thing to do. That's what you would look for. Yeah. R- really tough experiment to propose and get funding for because you don't know. It's it's iffy. But yeah. Yeah. that's the only way you're going to see evolution happening, right, instead of the history of evolution. That's right. Yep. That would be – those are the kind of events, you know, with more and more surveillance in the field and the ability to do genomics in the field already happening with viruses and 
I agree. Moving into these microbial systems as well, or bacterial systems as well, you could start to see that. And then, you know, can you start to kind of taking that experimental approach? Can you start to learn what is it um, that makes, or what are the, what's the, how does that process of horizontal gene transfer work? And if you can start manipulating that and then seeing what does that mean for like the potential of these things to adapt, then you're starting to not only kind of learn the rules of evolution, but manipulate them to understand it in a way that an engineer might start to understand, you know, a machine or something like that as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I agree with Nick Lane's um, point that um, you're not going to redo evolution, but how much fun to sort of kind of tackle it orthogonally from all of these different approaches and yeah, using totally. these different ideas. And, that, yeah. and that just this morning I saw an article in The Scientist. It's an opinion piece. Disease prediction by bat virus surveys is a waste. <laughs> and see that, it's not about prediction, though. It's about, like you said, learning the rules, right? Mm -hmm. See how viruses are changing in bats and how that might correlate with, you know, local circulation, maybe in other animals or whatever. Um, I think it's certainly worth doing. Of course, yeah. you can't do everything. That's the problem. We don't have enough scientists and enough money to do all the surveys. That's why... You know, a system like Legionella seems prime now that you have all these sequences and yep. do that there. Yeah. No, and it's surprising too, like the things that are the most obvious to uh, to do or that you might prioritize, you know, oh, if you want to cure cancer, you should be studying cancer or something like that. Um, time and again, basic science has shown that actually studying budding yeast actually will give you the rule book for yeah. how yeah. cells divide and then you start to apply that back and i think that holds too for yeah. these kind yeah. for these exact areas yeah sometimes hard to fund <laughs> as we've discussed time and again uh, you know that's it's a it's a problem more than just you know keeping labs going but there's so many cool ideas out there and mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that you have to you know stand on your head to get them funded but we can't fund everybody for everything totally i totally understand that yeah, tricky balance. Cool. Well, that was a fun paper to. It is very thought to yeah, thought provoking. Yeah. I like. Yeah, it. agree. Yeah. 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 Should we move on to our science picks of the week? You bet, Nels. Bet. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Well, I've got a couple. Uh, one, well, one theme in particular here. So, uh, January, end of January is Sundance Film Festival time in my backyard. So, my pick of the week is science in film mm. for, through the Sundance Film Festival. Um, I think this is a initiative with the um, Alfred Sloan Foundation to promote uh, filmmaking that includes scientific ideas or sci you know um, stories that have scientific uh, connections to it. Um, and so there's also a local connection that I wanted to raise here and promote a little bit. And this is uh, something that I have two colleagues here that are doing what they're calling science or science at Sundance. And they even have a Twitter feed, which is mm. confusingly at Science Sundance. Move the at at the beginning. Mm. Um, but check this out. So um, two colleagues. One is Mike Shapiro. He actually showed up on Twivo. He was mm. talking about his pigeon projects for thinking about developmental evolution, Evo Devo, right. of morphological forms. He and my colleague in the genetics department, Gabrielle Carden, have teamed up with um, three other scientists to troll around the Sundance Film Festival this year. They're picking out the science films and writing reviews mm -hmm. of them. And these will be um these will show up in the um in Science magazine um sometime in the next few weeks after the dust has settled on the Sundance um film festival. But you could follow it on Twitter. We'll put the uh, link there at Science Sundance and um kind of see in real time how they're mm. um, navigating the Sundance Film Festival and sort of lifting up some of the science that uh, shows up in the filmmaking. That's very cool. Yeah. Should be fun. So that, that's happening in your city there now, right? Correct? correct. Yeah. So end of January, I think it starts next week or even the end of this week, um, the, the film festival, it's uh, headquartered in Park City. So that's about mm -hmm. a 45-minute drive. Um, but there's all kinds of um, theaters in Salt Lake as well. Um, all over um, town here, uh, all kinds of movies and this is the time of year the celebrities show up. A lot of the directors and folks in, actually involved in the specific films that they've made as part of the festival, they'll um, be at the screenings and they'll have Q&A sessions. Really fun chance to connect with um, actors and filmmakers and kind of hanging out in the here in uh, Salt Lake. 
You ever go to see some films? I have, yeah. I saw, uh, I've seen a couple of films and it's sort of, you know, the way it's, so it turns out, it's a, you know, it can be competitive to get all these tickets, actually. You can go in almost on a lottery scenario, but I have have um, some friends who've given me some tickets from time to time. So it's been some really random walks of seeing movies, but the three or four I've gone to have been really exceptional. Um, and again, it's kind of connecting it through to the stories of the filmmakers themselves. It's really a special kind of connection to the film. Really fun. Yeah. So science in films is tough, right? Because to get a big audience, sometimes you have to bend it, you know? <laughs> That's for sure. Yep. Uh, but there have been some good uh, projects that don't, and uh, they portray science that the way it is, and I think they can be compelling. I remember watching a documentary about um, the, coll- the Hadron Collider and um, ha- how it was working in the postdoc work. It was just great because it was, it was totally suspenseful, you know? So it yeah. can be done properly. Yeah, that's a trick. And I think it takes real effort to, because the scientific process itself uh, is sometimes not the most, um, you know, action packed edge of your seat process. And yeah. so how yeah. do you portray that in a way that sort of grabs folks attention easier said than done, but really worth doing because if you can, highlight why that seemingly boring, you know, years long slog can lead to something that could be pivotal to understanding our world or, you know, predicting or um, understanding the inputs and things like climate change or or other, you know, massive issues that can start to, um, you know, move public opinion and just provide a real understanding of why all of this is so important. Well, the, the website for this initiative is in science and film. You know, they say, we want to illustrate the vital and unique roles of scientists and their work in, in our society. Mm-hmm. And, and that's true, not to, to boast or anything, but science is important. It's not the people, not the individual scientists, yep. it's the science. So that's right. it's good that they're recognizing that. Yeah. I also think, you know, Vincent, there's the, a, per, a public perception of what scientists do, which is that um, that we come up with answers, but then there's the kind of real life science where we come up with questions Mm -hmm. and just the time spent, not in sort of firm understanding of everything, but in pursuing something a little bit closer to what things really are. That's really hard to kind of get that across. And so I'm actually, as I age, I get more interested in new questions, right? Right, yeah. (laughs) Not so much answers, but, you know, the public wants a drug or a vaccine or some therapy for them, right? That's their end game of science. But, and that's important, and science has done a lot for that. But, man, like the stuff we talked about today, for me, it's way more interesting. Yeah, I agree. Well, and that's kind of why we're in the game, as they say. But, you know, it's a for us, it's a balance because we have to get funding for our lab and- you know, if you just dream all the time about interesting questions, you're not going to get funded. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I've been th- I've been trying to think about how to capture that tension. And the closest I've come, I'm not so sure if this will be my rough draft attempt of putting out there, is scientists practice weaponized curiosity. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Well, let it sink in. I don't know if it's ready for prime time. But anyway, Vincent, what's your science pick of the week? Well, mine is the uh, lunar eclipse we just had. Oh, yeah. This past weekend. So, you know, I'd heard of it. I'd heard of it uh, building up the previous week. And then I totally forgot about it. And mm. I was uh, walking. I was. I think it was last night. When did this happen? Sunday? Uh, two or, nights. Or last two nights. Night? Yep. Sunday night, I believe. Right. Yep. So Sunday, my wife and I are walking our dogs, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really cold and windy. It's really, it hurts, you know, to be out there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking through the, we have a lot of wooded area in our, where we live and I'm looking through the woods and there's the, the bloody moon is like two feet off the ground over there in the woods. Wow. And I said to me, look at that. Look how low the, first of all, it was huge, right? Yeah. It was white and it was really low to the ground. And I said, look, look at that. She goes, I can't say it. I'm going in. It's too cold. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. I said, I wonder why. The, and then I come in today and I realized it was the eclipse. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and yep. so there's a really good, My pick is a National Geographic uh, YouTube video. It's called Lunar Eclipse 101. It basically explains with really nice graphics, you know, what's going on, 
Yeah. Why does it turn red? What's the and the angles of the sun, the earth, and the moon that are involved? It's really interesting. Very uh, cool. You know, you you can see what's going on, and so I understand it was a cool one. There are lots of interesting um, time lapses and so forth. But if you want to learn the science behind it, this is like uh, I don't know, short. It's it's uh, less than five minutes. Oh yeah, I'm checking really this good. out now. It it's looks really, really cool. Yep. Yeah. So we saw it. We um, had some friends over for dinner Sunday night, and. Um, uh, I wasn't on my radar, but they knew it was coming. So we stepped outside and saw it right at the very beginning. And it was cold here too on Sunday night. So we like, you know, we lasted for about a minute and then we, <laughs> went, and then we went inside and then tried to time it, came back. That was about a quarter over and we got freezing and then went back inside, saw it about three quarters, went back inside. And then finally we did see it right at the end. Um, just a little bit of clouds coming over. So it wasn't, totally perfect but that was really fun i guess it was, was the um super blood wolf moon yeah they're yeah. calling it <laughs> yeah i totally forgot about it uh, but it would have been painful yeah it was, it was so cold but i don't know i think let's see sunday i don't remember what what i was doing but just ran i just saw it, it was so weird that it was so low and it didn't even hit uh, me that it that, that <laughs> was, was related happening. to yeah. the eclipse good luck that you saw it that's yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah cool all right, that is Tuivo number 39. You can find it on any good podcast player. And if you do listen on a player, just subscribe. We'd really appreciate it if you subscribe. That way we, we get subscription numbers. We can tell how many people we're listening. If you really like what we do, go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways you could help us financially, include pay, including Patreon or PayPal. You could give us a buck a month or whatever you'd like. We'd really appreciate that. Microbe.tv slash contribute. And, of course, questions, comments, Twevo at microbe.tv. Nels Eldi's at cellvolution.org. He's on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Good to catch up again. Yeah, really fun, as always. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Twevo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at trampledbyturtles.com. We've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. Be curious.